All right, super happy to be with Devon the Black Airbender. <laughs> Great Hello. to be with you, my friend. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Appreciate the beautiful palm trees in the back. Yeah. And uh, are you based in Hollywood? What part of Florida are you, are you based in? Uh, Miami. Miami. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I was down there a few weeks ago and saw you at an epic gathering. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was a beautiful gathering. <laughs> yeah, that was a beautiful a, gathering. A, a kid DJ. <laughs> yeah, there Blast, was a... Blasting some talent. Of like a 10 year old girl who's a DJ and she was, yeah, she was amazing. Yeah. It's not the first time I've seen her DJ her father. Oh, really? and yeah. Her father raised her pretty good with lots of intention and love. Sweet. Yeah. Well, tell people like if someone asks you, you know, I'd say, I think for my guests, it's a kind of a challenging question, but if someone asks you like, what do you do and who are you? Like, how do you want to answer that question? Yeah, so uh, my name is Yvonne, aka The Black Airbender. I'm the pioneer of Alchemy Breathwork, which is a nasal breathing uh, system utilizing nitric oxide, subliminal breathwork, uh, sacred geometry, and uh, be what I learned and got initiated under Be Good, all into one, and also utilizing the human technology in that perception. Sweet. Now, you have a certain thing that I noticed you wear in your head. Oh, the pyramid. Uh, the people and the visuals can see that. So can you explain like why you wear that and what, what the value of that is? Uh, so first of all, uh, this pyramid was created by Dr. Fred Bell, which is a, who is a NASA scholar. And he, uh, he, it's, this is organ plated. So it's not just metal plated. So there's a metal plate. Um, the process goes as they would, they would dust get, they would, uh, they would crystallize uh, crystals like citrine, quartz, amethyst, all into dust form. And then they would ionize gold and copper. So this is a fire dome. They have an original with just gold, but this is gold and copper. So they would ionize the metal and put them all together to create what you see here in the base is titanium. And it's proven to have um, cellular regeneration. You can cut open a banana, put it under the pyramid for X amount of days, and the other half will deteriorate a lot faster versus the other one under the pyramid. So lots of interesting pyramid technology uh, there right now. I even wear a necklace that has, it's like a satellite. So it uses protection in that sense. And it's, it's really, really healing. Awesome. And uh, I, of course, um, I presume breath work is another incredible way to optimize the body. I mean, I don't presume I know it because I, I actually, uh, we, we've led breath work stuff as well. So um, yeah, it's an incredible way to optimize mind, body, spirit. How did you get into it? How did you discover it? You know, to take us on the journey of how, how this began for you. Uh, so it started when I lost everything to a business partner a couple of years ago. And I went to Chinatown. They were giving a Bigo seminar. I told uh, my Sifu at the time what I was, uh, what I was going through and uh, he, he took me under his wing for a couple months and the rest is history from there. And I learned what I learned. I took what I learned in Bigu, uh, sacred geometry. And at the time I was going to different science fairs as well and took what I learned from different NASA scholars, which uh, is a different form of uh, perception of science because NASA scholars, they love to mix. Uh, they're way ahead of the curve when it comes to quantum and the spirituality of things. So I, I took what I learned from them and I put them all into what I call alchemy breathwork. And is this something, is this like a path that you've been on, you know, since you were born or was there some kind of like turning point of that, that opened up this pathway for you and this path of uh, exploration and, and research for you? Yeah, there's um. I was always a wanderer. It started with conspiracies first. <laughs> it started with conspiracies first. And then, um, you know, when I lost everything, that was my big aha moment. And the biggest conspiracy that I'll say to this day, you know, on this whole path and journey is things that distract us from healing ourselves and optimizing our bodies to the fullest potential. That's the number one biggest conspiracies of them all. 
And what was the business that you had that you lost? Uh, it was Organite and uh, crypto. Okay. Yeah. So you, you've been on the kind of the path of holistic health and alternative ways of looking at things for, for a while. And then you kind a of long time. accelerated it. Um, so did you grow up in a family that was like, had that kind of understanding and imparted that onto you? Yeah, so that was, uh, I think that's actually the main starting point that really led me on this journey because in my family, heart disease is a big thing. And, uh, I'm, you know, it's, it starts with me. You know, it starts with me breaking that curse. Mm-hmm. And in terms of diabetes and uh, the heart attack, it started with my grandpa being at, being at his deathbed. And, and I didn't want to go through that, you know. And, and um, other, other family was having the same issues. And... Um, I'm, I'm literally leading the way in that regard. So I took it upon myself to start there when, when I went uh, vegetarian and then I went vegan slowly. And then I went into uh, the whole fasting world, so to speak. And, and Bigu really um, getting initiated under Bigu, that really amplified a lot of things for me when it comes to, to fasting. Because Bigu is um, a Taoist practice where it's um, cultivating energy to the point where you don't need dense, quote unquote, foods. How do you spell bigu? Uh, B-I-G-U. B-I-G-U, just like it sounds. Yep. <laughs> so would that be in the realm of uh, breatharianism? Yes, you could say that. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh-huh. So, so tell me about that. Like, is, is that something that you've, have you encountered people that are, that are breatharians? Is that your aspiration and just kind of tell us about a little bit about breatharianism yeah so so the thing with um breatharianism it's you know i've encountered um you know there's different levels to it there's Mm -hmm. you know now we're getting you're introduced to more intermittent fasting so you now seeing science finally catching up to what eastern philosophies were talking about in terms of fasting and the benefits it has and it, breatharianism is very different from just fasting because you need another quote, you're, you're literally replacing another energy input in the body instead of food. So the main point is amplifying cellular regeneration to the point where you don't need food. Because when you look at autophagy and the science that's coming out, you know, cells eat other cells. And in terms of electrons as well, they don't necessarily eat foods. We put foods inside their body to create that quote unquote chemical reaction. And that's what the cells are technically feeding off of. And that's why we have quote unquote waste, quote unquote poop. (laughs) And that tells you that the body isn't utilizing all of it, right? So there you go with that. And um, I've been on liquids for four years and I've been two years, 80%. And then I went 100%. um, It's coming almost to, to a full two years. And that's not even including the days I went dry. What you may perceive as dry, what I call chronic feeding. In, in that sense. And the max I went uh, for 30 days, no food, no water for 30 plus days. And uh, that was a real big eye-opening experience for me. Did you just say you've been on a liquid diet for four years? For four years. <laughs> well, I like to call it live it. Let's, let's use live it. <laughs> so no solid food for four years? For four years and counting. Yes, sir. <laughs> and so, so what, what kind of liquids are you, are you putting in your body? So it's 90% for right now, it's literally 90% coconut water. The rest is juices like orange juice, mint is really my favorite. Um, uh, sometimes I'll do smoothies from time to time, but uh, mainly coconut water. And how do you feel on, on the, the liquid diet for four years? <laughs> Still growing in mass. So I'm, I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> and then is, is the ultimate goal to let that go as well? Or is that or is the liquid diet where you want to maintain? Uh, I don't want to say it's the ultimate goal, but I feel like um, I can, if I really wanted to, I can go in and out realms in that sense for sure. Right now, it's really based off, for me, it's really taste. It really, really is a taste thing at this point mm-hmm. when it comes to liquids. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, because I've been feeling that too, is like, I have these kind of insights as, as we evolve in our consciousness as a, as a species, are we going to still, I just had this insight that we won't be eating food anymore. I don't know when that is or, you know, what, what that is, but it's interesting because I've had that insight myself. 
Yeah, I truly believe, I don't think veganism will, will change the world. I believe fasting will change the world because fasting, you can have more compassion towards all diets, quote unquote, you know? Uh, yeah. And that I think the compassion side is where uh, most, quote unquote, you would call extreme diets lack in the sense. So that's how I go about it. I'm not hardcore liquid Aaron. I'm not in terms of like preaching the message. That's why I really preach breath more than um, changing uh, diets or lifestyles. You know, I'll tell you this. I work with um, I worked with some bodybuilders myself in, in this profession. And, you know, I don't force anyone on to change different uh, livets, so to speak. I literally let the breath do the talking. And the more you the more breath work you do and the more healing you can feel, the more, you know, body awareness you have to the point where, you know, for a fact, you don't need to be eating X amount, that amount, and it, it becomes more of an emotional eating at, at a certain point. And that is the power of breath. And that's, that's my message. Yeah, well, let's get into it. Let's talk about the breath. It's like the prana, <laughs> right? So what, what I hear you saying is that you're, you're getting so much energy and vitality from the air around you that you don't need to go to foods to energize yourself. It's, so you're kind of, you're, you're, is that, that makes, is that right? Is that on the right track? Yes, sir. So yeah, for some, let's say someone doesn't really know what breath work is, or they haven't been exposed to it. How do you, how could you articulate? What's an intro way of explaining? Breath, uh, breath work. So breath work, at least, um, yeah, breath work in general, it's, a form of breathing exercises to either regulate the blood into either parasympathetic or sympathetic. And that's actually the, one of the main things that Alchemy Breathwork focus on. We focus more on getting more into the parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest, digest, and heal versus sympathetic, which is fright or flight. And what's Survi the survival instance. And what's the breath pattern that brings somebody into that state? What, what is the Alchemy Breathwork? So, Alchemy, it's not technically a technique. Like I said before, it's more of a system where we literally have 100 plus different ways of breathing, quote unquote, with the nose. But in general, uh, the main foundational pillar is that we emphasize more on the exhales and the inhales. Because if we know that 70% of the blood is pumped by the lungs, we know for a fact that 70% of toxin release is done by gas. And shoot, you can lose weight, you can, uh, but beyond that, you amplify healing overall. And if we know that quality breaths equal quality life, equal quality cellular regeneration, that is the connection there in, in that regard. Hmm. And you do workshops, right? You're leading workshops with people through, through this breathwork process. Yeah, I'm actually one of the few people in the world that would will breathe with you for a whole year, <laughs> literally. So uh, we also have um, what I call breath family. So we do Zoom calls uh, and we do workshops in that regard, yes. And I've worked with uh, different companies, contracted with different office spaces, signed a lot of NDAs that I can, I can now say that I've worked with Google and Facebook now because that's over with. So... Uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun in terms of sharing the breath. And that's what alchemy is about, utilizing the breath in everyday life. So it's not too mundane. And we're having a lot of fun with the breath because that's what it's about. We Instead of turning to food for fun, you can turn to different breath patterns for fun. And that's what it's all about. You know, it's interesting. There is like this natural high you get from, from breathing deeply. That's so amazing. And like, I remember when I first turned into it, I'm like, you know, my whole life I've been searching for this and that and all these different things to try to feel good, you know, and it's like, oh my God, it was, it was here all along. It's like in every single breath, I just didn't pay attention to it, just didn't tune into it and tap into it. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's one of the many wonders of the world that we quote unquote may take for granted, <laughs> right? Kind of like you're talking about the distraction, you know, we get distracted in all these different things. Yeah. Yeah. What is your, I heard you saying something, I was listening to, I told you some of your videos before we got on, like, what is your, speaking of distractions, uh, your take on like the media and the news and are these things that you tune into TV, movies, uh, the screen, you know, are these, what's, what's your approach or what's your, 
I guess what's your approach first, and then maybe any advice you have on people in that regard? Uh, in that regard, if it's, there's a question that I always ask myself when it comes to those things, okay. either is it elevating me or uh, even, even with food itself, like, you know, that's one question you should ask yourself whenever you eat something, uh, do you feel energized or do you feel weak or tired or sleepy? If you feel weak or tired or sleepy, the food literally ate you <laughs> versus you eating the food. So same thing applies to social media, uh, TV, um, any type of things in, in that regard as well. And, you know, I've, I've also worked with even people in the acting world or people in the, in the news media world. You know, they're also human, too. And we also have to give that compassion to them as well. Um, stay tuned for the next subliminal breathwork, because many people think that since I reside in this part of the health spectrum, that I don't have compassion for um, people going through COVID. And even with the thing with COVID, they're finding that... Uh, nitric oxide itself is a great propellant for, for COVID. And it's unfortunate because, um, and I think this was totally deliberate, where um, the, in the doctor's field, there's only a few people in the whole entire world that is um, in regulation in terms of nitric oxide, oxide therapy. So it can't be mass produced the way it should be. So hence, here comes alchemy breathwork. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. And what is subliminal breathwork? So subliminal breathwork um, was found uh, with me and a friend who literally can make music with his brain and he'll fire certain neurons and it'll create certain tunes. So we both did breathwork and this is also on my YouTube as well. We both did breathwork together and we found that we were creating a certain rhythm and tune together. And you can, you can see that the different breathing patterns create different um, rhythmic and, and tunes. And it's such a cool experiment that we did. And there was a point where I told them, all right, be quiet and listen to the way that I breathe for a minute. And I would breathe in a certain different breathing patterns. And we found different breathing patterns. We're just listening could amplify theta and alpha waves in different, in different ways. So Imagine, you know, there's even points within some of my, some of my subliminal breathwork music where you can't even hear the breath at all. And um, to that certain point, I've only found certain microphones, high quality microphones to record and where you can't actually hear me breathe really deep to a certain extent. It's going to affect someone that's listening to it. Beautiful. And you said theta waves and what's the other wave? Alpha waves. Alpha waves. So could you share what is theta waves and alpha waves? Yeah, so theta, theta and alpha, so theta in particular, it's, it's literally, it gets you into a trance of, um, of healing. You know, you're in theta when you quote unquote sleep. When you wake up, actually, that's when theta is actually at an all time high. And that's when you're more prone to hypnosis. So why not, you know, when you wake up, either meditate or listen to more positive music of anything so you can get it deep into your subconscious. Sweet. Sweet. What is your, um, you know, I, I'm curious your view on um, masks, particularly as it affects breathing. Because I've been like, you know, as I was traveling stuff and just a, a lot of people right now who are like wearing the mask all day, you know, eight mm -hmm. times a day, they, they work for different companies and things and they're required to wear the mask. Right. You feel like that has an effect on people's ability to, to breathe, take in oxygen, take in the air around them? Oh, big time. So um, most people are mostly breathing with um, their mouth, if anything. So that you're increasing um, an, an imbalance there when you're breathing more with uh, your mouth than your nose. And the nose is a great filter. So many people out there uh, have low CO2 tolerance. And the higher CO2 tolerance you have, I'll give you an, a, an, uh, an example where I worked with um, people who like to go hiking up the mountain right? The more farther up you go in the mountain, the less oxygen you have to use. Mm -hmm. So the saying goes, the saying goes, it's not the more that you breathe, the less you need. It's the more efficiently you breathe, the less you need. So if I'm breathing more efficiently on a mountain, the less I need to take in oxygen because the more CO2 tolerance increases, the more oxygen delivery 
And that way I actually don't have too much quote unquote air hunger. And that's where most people suffer when it comes to masks. They have a lot of air hunger. And the more air hunger you have, the more you're gonna suffer. Keyword hunger, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So CO2 tolerance is also an electrical force in the body. 90% of your atoms is made of carbon. So we're actually carbon-based beings. We're not oxygen-based beings. So the more carbon you have in the body, the easier it is to take in oxygen and use it more efficiently to the point where these people that I have hiking up the mountain don't even need the oxygen tank anymore. They only need to bring one, if any. And that's like with two weeks of consistent alchemy breath work uh, with a nose, if anything. Because mm. most people are breathing more with their, with their mouth when they wear these masks. And that's where the viral load will start to happen. And that's where all these problems start to come in. And that's a, that's a low-key thing that's happening, unfortunately. And the air that, can be, that you can intake is being restricted, right? You have this thing. Exactly. You. Maybe you have. Exactly. Three, they're recommending I'll, 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 I'll tell masks. you this. I had, I had one client with a deviated septum. And he had to, he had to wear a mask because he works in a herbal store. And we were working on the breath work. And he does the breath work while he's wearing the mask. And a simple one you can do is three in <laughs> and three out. <laughs> That's a simple one you can start doing and you can find the difference just in that simple uh, breathing technique and you will find a different resonance of just overall feeling because you're, you're, you're amplifying more of your sinuses. Anytime you use the mouth, you're telling your sinuses to turn off. Yeah. And that, and that reduces oxygen delivery to the brain. So the more you can amplify sinus production the more you can efficiently use oxygen to the brain, thus sending a shockwave to the whole entire body to amplify more the parasympathetic because your frontal lobe is where the pineal gland and all the other glands that deal with the parasympathetic in terms of healing reside. How about the environment that you're in? In other words, like, do you factor in uh, the air quality uh, as far as breathing and breath work and quality of life, is that something that you, you factor into the, your so I was, I, Yeah, uh, yes, it does, for sure. Um, uh, the, more, the more you can be around greenery, for sure, is the best. Um, I love Miami here because the, the salt water, the ions, is definitely rich. I'm literally five minutes away from the beach here, and I can definitely feel the difference versus me living in Jersey. But there is a plus when it comes to the cold weather, I'm not going to lie, where um, there's even a simple meditation. If you're, if you're in the cold, just pay attention to the fog coming out your nose and the fog coming in your nose. And that's a simple because you're adding more um, mass in terms of um, the ionic atmosphere. Because whatever, you're, whatever you look at, going back to the double split experiment, you know, when they, when they shoot the atom, towards their target, if they're looking at it, it splits. If they don't look at it, it doesn't split. So uh, there's a benefit when it comes to the cold, depending on how you're breathing in that sense. But overall, the more you can be closer to more negative ions in the air, the better. And that is more with nature rather than the city part. And uh, you can definitely feel a difference in, in that aspect. So the ocean is a big one. Right. Big one, yes. And then any kind of like plant life, trees, forest, uh, that. And then the third component would be um, there can be a benefit to um, colder air at times as well. So those are those are the three I heard you. Yeah, I I, I look at I look at cold air as a crystallized prana because that's what it is. You can you can feel it more, and you can um. In in terms of the How cold are we talking? Air. Is there a limit? <laughs> um, but no, there, there is no limit. <laughs> there's whatever no you, limit whatever you can, whatever you can tolerate, and whatever you can take. Yeah, whatever you yeah. can tolerate. If you can do breath work within the cold, and take advantage of it. What I used to do is, um, when I used to live in Jersey, as soon as I woke up, I would be shirtless, walk around the block a couple times, and do some walking breath work, and just take it all in. Were you inspired by uh, Wim Hof's stuff at all? His yeah, yeah. I'm, I I definitely give reverence uh, to Wim Hof. Definitely give respect to that guy, for sure. The Ice Man who can be in very extremely cold temperatures, and so you can <laughs> so you can. There's a lot of 
I don't know what to call them, uh, powers or CDs you can access through the breath as well that people have accessed. One is um, moderating your temperature with the climate around right. you, whether it's, which can be with extreme cold, but also extreme heat. That's, I think that's when people don't realize as much. Um, one thing I one thing I learned with um, being barefoot a lot there's um there's this there's this uh, Jamaican speaker I'm part Jamaican by the way so there's this Jamaican speaker at home uh, and his name's Muta Baruka and he's been traveling the world giving different lectures and things like that and he's been walking barefoot and he made a really good point saying that uh, when people look at him in in cold areas they're like aren't you gonna wear shoes and like no the cold and the and the heat are this almost the same they really have that. Um, you know, they get to a certain point where the cold um, really, uh, really stings the body in a sense. And there gets a certain point where the heat, quote unquote, stings the body. And there's um, different yogis that literally bathe with fire. So <laughs> it's the same thing as, uh, as, as cold therapy in that sense. And like um, coming here, you know, a lot of people I see here love the air condition, but um, I'll, I'll be outside for X amount of hours, seven plus hours and, and be fine as long as you're breathing correctly because your skin breathes too. So mm -hmm. when you can control that, the easier it is to quote unquote tolerate the heat or the cold. And do you do air, what's your, what's your view on air conditioning? Do you do air conditioning for yourself? Oh no, I, I try to do less air condition as much as possible. I like the natural flow of things when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. And being barefoot, I think they, I think they call it now earthing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a word for it now. Yeah. Is that something that you advocate? Oh yeah. I'm 90% barefoot out here in Miami. Literally. <laughs> like little, literally, literally right now. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> now, another thing I heard you mention uh, in, on Instagram, which, you know, the fact that you've been on a liquid diet for four years, I'm sure is pretty, amazing and shocking to people so many people but you also heard you talk about semen retention mm. so talk talk about your journey there uh so even growing up i used to be addicted to porn i'm not afraid to say that mm -hmm. most people are or most people are afraid to admit it as well mm -hmm. and that that's perfectly okay mm -hmm. but um starting on that journey mm, i realized um it was a problem as a kid and as I got older, I saw the benefits of um, retaining my seed and giving up, giving up porn. But more so, it was more of a psychological thing for me because I could see the detrimental parts that uh, porn was affecting different parts of my relationships with family, friends, and um, uh, different types of relationships in terms of intimacy as well. And that got me to do some research into it and um, see the benefits it has in terms of what's actually in semen, that it's uh, so many minerals and so many benefits that it has. And uh, we all, we all, in terms of this society, you, you know, when going back into conspiracies in itself, you know, why is sexuality so pushed? Why is it, why is it viewed a certain way? Why does society view it a certain way? And the, the more you look into it, the more you look into it, the more you can see why uh, certain societies push um, sexuality in a certain way. When in actuality, we're all supposed to be naked. We're all supposed to be, you know, we were born naked anyway. So, you know, in terms of hypersexualization, hyper we see the, the, the pitfalls it has mentally and overall interactions with each other. Mm. And so, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, the more I dived into it, the more I could see um, my overall energy started to spike. And I took advantage of it in, in that regard. And um, at the time too, I was, I almost played professional volleyball. And I noticed in my volleyball game, I would have more energy, more stamina. I could last longer on the court. I wouldn't be um, out of breath, so to speak, even before, even before I knew about breath work. <laughs> but um, yeah, it has so many benefits. It's literally a life force. And if it can literally create a baby, imagine what it's doing to your body internally as well the more it builds up and the mere fact that it takes 75 days for it to mature tells you enough how, how long it takes, how much energy it takes for it to be more potent in the body. And how long have you retained your semen for? Uh, it's been a six year journey. So six years. Yeah. 
<laughs> and um, was it hard at first? Did it take some time to like? Oh, big time! That? Yeah, yeah. Th there was some um, slip ups. There was what there, there was wet dreams as well. Like you name it, <laughs> mm -hmm. had, had those. So are you are you celibate or are you sexually active while retaining your seed? So there's a difference between being celibate and quote unquote tantric as we like yeah. to, some, yeah. some like to, people are starting to get aware of it. Right. I am, I am definitely pro tantric instead of celibacy. Um, and there's you no know, tantric doesn't just mean um, intercourse with your partner as well. There's many different sides of it that many people don't even talk about, yeah. but um, tantric is also a mindset as well, because even in the nofap or semen retention community, you know, there's a thing called edging and edging is where you don't actually masturbate, but you watch porn and that's technically considered, that's something considered edging. Yeah. And edging in itself, even if you watch porn and you're not in the sense doing it or doing the quote unquote deed, it's still having an effect on you internally as well. And certain, chemi certain chemicals will be released. Mind you, the body doesn't know the difference between what's being seen with the eyes and it's thinking that oh that's that's actually that's that's me right you can you can use this analogy when watching um scary movies right when someone's running for their lives or things of that nature yeah. you're gonna start to feel that, ang that anxiety because the body doesn't know the difference we have so many mirror receptors in our bodies and that's why subliminal breath work in itself is so powerful too because you know many people can't um many people won't embark on this four-year liquid journey but be me recording my essence and the the in-depth of breath that i can bring into a recording they're going to feel that even more themselves and i've been honored to have um different shamanic healers and even well-known djs come to me and say that's what you're doing is really um medicine music so mm -hmm. i just want to touch up on that as well sweet Okay, so I have a question here. So, so if you, when you release your, when you release your semen, there's all kinds of proteins and all kinds of things in there, and you're you're dissipating your energy, you're losing your energy, you're losing your life force, your vitality. Um, so I get that. If you um, awaken your sexual energy and move your sexual energy without releasing your semen, like. Do you feel like that's a positive for yourself physically or a negative for yourself that's physically? A, that, or does it that, depend on how you're doing it? That's a big positive versus someone who's just celibate. That's okay. where I, that, you know, that's where. That's the tantric component. That's a tantric com component. Mm -hmm. Because you're not losing minerals. You're also not losing pints of blood, by the way. So much blood goes into making semen. Mm. And lots of energy in, in that aspect. That's mm. why, um, you know, when people release they they feel all tired and droggy yeah. you're, you're yeah. supposed to feel the opposite yeah but if you can move the sexual energy without that semen release then you could Ooh. actually activate your system and like you know enliven your system and maybe even create healing uh in your system in different ways so let's look at the mri and the brain if you look at the mri and the brain you see white fluid and gray fluid what do you think is the white fluid in the brain it's, it's partially semen. And what, what goes, quote unquote, up to the brain in terms of breath? The spine. What's in the spine? Semen. Even women themselves actually create semen. Many people don't even know that. So I didn't know that. If you're, That's cool. If you, <laughs> yeah, if you're attaining most of it, it's, it's really healing to the brain in itself and giving it a, a wash. That's what it does. And that, and that, that's a, that's also, you can say the spiritual side of it as well, because more of the brain is getting more nutrients from that and it's healing at a, at a faster rate. Mm -hmm. So if someone's watching pornography and they're edging, so they're moving energy, but they're not releasing their semen. Like, what is your, what is your view on that? Or what is your take on that? So most likely that person is going to have a wet dream and well, what happens then? <laughs> mm -hmm. There you go. You're, you're, losing, you're losing some vital fluid in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. So that's why the mental side of it is so important. And the breathwork side of it is so important too, because the more you retain, the more 
um, in, in Hindu, they call the nadis or I like to call it just the veins in particular that holds the sperm get stronger and stronger in terms of holding it. And that way you won't have quote unquote wet dreams at all. And that's why I think breath work is definitely important. So you can amplify healing in that aspect. So um, the less you have quote unquote wet dreams and the less discharge you have in that aspect. Mm -hmm. And, but then, but then having a, perhaps having like a, a partner or a beloved or someone that you're sharing love and connection and sensual energy, maybe erotic energy with can be healthy and can be, uh, create vitality while, oh, retain, big time. while retaining your semen. L let's talk about the benefits that way. Uh, in terms of semen retention, you last longer in bed. That's one that many people would think the opposite, but no, you last longer in bed. And you have more energy when you're, quote unquote, having orgasms. Having orgasms versus releasing is two different things. So it's more of an internal orgasm. And then when you're sharing it with your partner, they feel it even more. And you can last longer and longer and longer versus someone who's always consistently spilling the seed. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of being tantric. Mm -hmm. Now, how about for women? Uh, how would you, how, what, how does it work if you're a woman or like, is it, is there something that's that's the equivalent to that, or is it a different thing? So the equivalence to that is when they have their period. You know, women are okay with squirting and releasing all they want versus men, you know, that's, that's vital fluid right there. But women, it's more so the period. And that's why I emphasize, I advocate actually, whenever you have your period blood to put it back on your skin so your body can reabsorb um, those vital nutrients, it's literally blood, you're literally losing blood. So mm -hmm. the more I've seen uh, where you go on uh, more fasting or more of a healthier uh, lifestyle, the less period you actually um, have. And many women might find this shocking because they've been unfortunately brainwashed to believe that you're supposed to be consistently having your period over and over and over and over and over and over again. Everyone's really different, but I will, de it's definitely common where um, you're healing at a faster rate where you're supposed to be having less of it. To my, my partner in, in particular, she, she, has, um, she has less of it now. It's, it's, it's night and day and she feels more vital energy in that aspect. So when you, you have your period, you know, put on your hair, put on your skin. You know, now you see in, uh, in Los Angeles, there's a big thing with that where um, I think they, I don't know what particular blood mechanisms they use, but they're taking injections inside their face. I think uh, Kim Kardashian's a big one utilizing that. So there's so many benefits to it. Mm -hmm. Another thing I've heard about uh, uh, orgasm with women is that there's the internal orgasm, which is different than the clitoral orgasm. Right. Uh, so I've heard, you know, this is obviously just someone's perspective, but a Tantra teacher that the clitoral orgasm, you're kind of, you're this kind of woman like depleting her energy where the deeper orgasm is the movement of the energy inside. But it's interesting because, yeah, because there's a, you know, there's a lot more talk about, uh, I guess the men, the men, the, the male buy, the male buys is a little easier to sometimes, you know, see and see how it works. And they, the woman is her, her, a little bit more complicated <laughs> internal internal and more complex yeah, right so it's it's fascinating but this is great Let, let's get into some more like hacks of like you know holistic hacks ways to like really optimize your health and well-being how about meditation is that something that is a part of your routine well that's what breath work is <laughs> i like that i like that. breath work breath work is a form of meditation and in my eyes you know when you look when we look at medi or just the etymology, meditation at the core is pure focus on, on one thing. You know, even in Kung Fu, you know, uh, the great Taoists or um, uh, who's that? Who's the, uh, the big emperor that in China that built the Great Wall that uh, went to different dynasties and overtook them? I don't know. Uh, uh, darn uh, but he was part of the Mong. He was ahead of the Mong the Mongols, and um, uh, his he had a Sifu within the dynasty, and the Sifu's the Sifu would say one of his philosophies would be um, the painter is doing kung fu, um, the 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 um, 
even down to the construction worker is doing Kung Fu. The, the, per, the cleaner is doing Kung Fu because it's repetition and repetition to build a certain frequency. And that even leads to what I always say, what you do frequently literally becomes your frequency. What you do frequently becomes your frequency. I like that. That's awesome. What's your view on um, plant medicine? Uh, is that something that you can see being a part of someone's path or what, what is your? Yeah. It, yeah. If it's, if it's a calling, mm -hmm. then I say, I say, go for it. Um, I used to be on the opposite side of it where, um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. I used to be on the opposite part of it where um, I just fell into the dogma of things when it comes to plant medicine. And there was one point where I sat down with my friend, Tommy Lockward, who, who worked with Dr. Sebi himself. And, you know, was another practitioner that I've attracted into my life who I can really call a close friend of mine at this point. And, you know, we talked about ayahuasca and we talked about different plant medicines of that sort. And he was explaining how Aya brings your body to a certain vib vibratory resonance where you're quote unquote purging. Any energy that's within it is ending you at quote unquote to purge, right? And when he said that, it's like, well, it's kind of interesting you put it that way because I kind of viewed Aya as a different, a different mechanism in, in that regard. I used to until he ch totally changed my mind in that aspect because when he said it that way, you know, it really harmonizes with um, what I've went through with different clients where we'll be doing certain breath work and go really deep to the point where they start puking. So, you know, breath itself is a, is a medicine. And um, the deeper you can resonate within the breath, the deeper you can actually take on these quote unquote plant medicines. I actually did my first Aya experience um, a month ago. It's only been a month ago. And um, uh, when I took it, I, I did, we started at 6 p.m. all the way to 10 a.m. I was literally doing breath work the whole entire time. And there was a certain point where I was, um, I was literally, you know, I really thought that I already could feel what my organs feel like in terms of the breath, breathing real deep in that essence. But there was a certain point where I could breathe so deep where I felt different parts of my organs start to start to rumble. And my partner, she was in the ceremony with me. And I asked her afterwards, I was like, um, do you heard my stomach rumbling at a certain point? She's like, yeah, I did. And I was like, that wasn't my stomach. That was really my kidneys and my spleen, like making a certain, um, certain movement to cause what you were hearing. And she's like, that's interesting. And then I did an integration and I shared my story on Clubhouse recently. And um, someone who's, was doing, who does um, Tai Chi practices for over 20 plus years said, well, I wanna ask you, Devon, real quick, do you know anything about organ breathing? Or organ breathing? I was like, yeah, I know, I know organ breathing. I know all about that. He's like, well, that's interesting because the mere fact that um, he asked me, well, did you, did you set the intention to do organ breathing when going into Aya? I was like, no, not at all. I was just breathing in different mannerisms in different ways. Well, you said you got, you literally got to the point where we call this, um, breathing into the bones. Mm. And that's, you know, when he said that, I was like, it, it clicked, it made sense because there's a different form of mechanisms where I can go deep into my body, where I can really breathe into my bones at a certain point. Um, because of being on Aya. But, you know, one of the main things that made me say yes to Aya was um, just going back to the indigenous tribes of, of how they came about utilizing this. Imagine there was no scientific technologies to say that this is a poison, we're going to die. So how did they know to take this bark of a tree, that bark of a tree, and make it into medicine? So they, that's, how, that's how you know they were so in tuned into na the natural law of things. Yeah, like divinely guided. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing to, to look at that and feel into that. Yeah, yeah. so I view it as not just plant medicine, especially when it comes to Aya, it's more of a technology. And, yeah. you know, you, you can try to replicate um, all these different plant medicines like weed or whatever, but you can't replicate um, Aya. It's one of the interesting um, scientific scratches on the head just like the pyramids they still can't figure out how they build the pyramids and things of that nature right 
Yeah, we have an interesting synchronicity here. So I, like you, I had some, I had like an ideology around plant medicine. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty open-minded. Everyone has their own path, their own way. Right. But uh, I had a clear sense that like, you know, not for me. And, uh, and about a week and a half ago, I, I, I was in ceremony for the first time. Oh. as well <laughs> oh all right synchronization there synchronization and um yeah I, I really liked the way you articulated that and the way you shared that i learned the idea of like you're opening up this higher vibration and then yeah when anything that's not aligned with that is going to come to the surface and it could be scary or it could be uncomfortable or it could be whatever it's going to be but it's coming to the surface to be basically exposed or to be seen and then to be release which which can come out as purging or however it however it manifests itself right. even like, crying is technically crying. Purging. Yeah. yeah and i'm sure you see that with the breath work right you'll see people crying and you'll see yep maybe people even going through like you know shouting or different things that emerge yeah big time <laughs> a yeah. lot of things yeah so i think that's good for people to know of like you know that there's these things happen and just to be uh, just to be in the moment be authentic to whatever's coming through you and whatever's coming through you is for the best to be to be to be released to be moved to be let go pen up stuck stuff just has to find a way out exactly <laughs> yeah beautiful um anything else that you want to share that you want people to know about that you'd like people to you think would be valuable for people to um, I, I definitely want to add to the, the fact that, you know, water has memory, right? And um, that's also one of the reasons why I said yes to Aya at the time. And trust me, there's many different ways Aya came to me, but I said it has to come in this way. And it literally came in this way when I moved to Miami. So, like I said, <laughs> it's a technology. And, you know, people that are hardcore into fasting or hardcore into the breath aneurysm world are maybe a little bit too much into their ego in that sense, don't realize that um, technically the fruits, the food, it's, you know, they may look at ayahuasca and all these other plant medicines as drugs, quote unquote, well, the food and the fruits and the things, all that nature is technically the same thing. Yeah. It's, and there's so many, you know, I have itself just beyond it being a psychedelic, um, there's so many vitamins and nutrients within it that don't really get talked about too much, which you know, I definitely should um, do like a sit down interview with my friend Tommy and have him go over that again. But just to view it in that nature and be more um, compassionate in that sense. And going back to the sense of just imagine how connected our ancestors were to understanding, um, creating and combining all these different things together to create Aya. And there was a one, there's one group in particular that I think it's like the, um, I forgot which tribe in particular, but, but they already knew where Sirius was way before scientists even figured it out. And I forgot what tribe that is not coming to mind right now, but just a mere fact, that's the main point I want to point out of how, of how close He's got uh, something happening with his mic or his headphones. Something's happening. So we're just being patient, waiting for him to come back in and finish. We're, we're on the edge of our seat, waiting for the completion of that thought. But yeah, I'll just share something while you're, while you're there, which is um, you bring up... Um, science is a whole really fascinating uh, thing to look at. It's like what we call science now and it's the way it's sort of been misused in different ways and been manipulated and people use it to trick people into certain things. And, you know, what is pure science? And I think a lot of those indigenous cultures, they, they have a science that we haven't fully come to, to respect or, or honor yet. It's a, different, it's a different kind of science, it's more pure in a sense, you know, it's not so much in the head, it's just a very direct relationship with, uh, with the earth 
and, and, and be able to observe it in a very deep way and almost become kind of one with it. So you have this kind of, it's almost deeper than observation. You know, it's like mm -hmm. experiential, experiential truth. Yeah, um, before the West came over to um, the different tribes that had Aya, little do people know when ceremony happened, it would only be one person drinking Aya, the, the medicine. And then everyone would sit in ceremony and then people would still be purging and um, releasing, quote unquote. So that's how powerful um, that technology is. And then it's then it's then when the West came over, and that's when you started t um, intaking Aya as a participant. But before it would just be the shaman taking it, and then you would feel what the shaman was feeling, and that would give the vibratory resonance because that's what it's doing to then purge or increase your frequency in a certain way. Really interesting. Uh, you mentioned water, uh, so let's touch on that really quick. I, um... I'm assuming you're a proponent of drinking water. Uh, do you want to say anything about that? Like, is water something that's important for people, and what what kind of water? And uh, so, so I'm a, I'm a proponent of drinking structured water for sure. Okay. Structured water is definitely key. Um, uh, I think uh, you know our bodies make distilled water. The fact that our bodies make distilled water should tell us that it's not just distilled water; it's structured is so water looking at quote unquote urine that's what it is in terms of blood plasma and um, when it comes to structure our dna can synthesize very well when it comes to structured water than just plain water or um ionized water in that sense because there's a natural natural ionization comes from fruit juices plant juices vegetable juices and that's very powerful in terms of healing so what is structured water and like, how do we get it? You know, how do we, how do we access it? <laughs> so there's many, many different ways of, of viewing structured water. Um, a simple thing that I love to share and I'm happy I shared this with because when, I, when Texas was going through what they went through, many clients was reaching back to me and was saying, I'm happy I found out about the Myron glass. So the Myron glass is a powerful glass where it is a, it's like a filter. So it's a black glass. And if you put it in the sun, it literally emanates like a violet ray. And in terms of the violet spectrum, it's one of the highest spectrums of frequency where it's not technically visible to the human eye, but it only, it only absorbs UVA rays and infrared rays. So it's really like you're drinking the sun and you only needed to put it out in the sun for 30 plus minutes and that's it. Versus other glasses like blue glasses or a clear glass, blue glasses, I think, I think, uh, takes three hours for it to get structured in terms of the water. Uh, a regular glass will take seven plus hours. And that's, um, that's very powerful in terms of absorbing more biophotons and healing the body. And that's uh, one of the most simplest ways of um, introducing structured water to people who want to get into that and really amplify their overall being. And what does it mean, structured water? Like, how do you define that? So again, we, we know that scientists are now saying that water has technology. And we look at Dr. Emoto's um, research when he put words on different waters and we could m view it on a microscope and see that it changes structure versus, you know, you can do a simple um, study where you can have different rices and put love, hate, whatever. And you see that the hate will deteriorate a lot faster and get a lot of moldy versus the one that says love on it. So water is literally in everything, in the air we breathe, in our food, in everything we drink. It's all around us. We're in an ocean of water, even though we can't see it. It's not just air you're breathing. It's you're literally breathing in an ocean. So part of structured water is putting this conscious intention into it, like in putting the energy of love into it, putting the energy of the, this highest vibration possible. And that's, that's one of the ways of structuring the water as well. Yes, sir. Fantastic. Yeah. And that, that's probably the last thing to touch on is just like the connection between the physical and the mental and the spiritual and the emotional, right? Like, like, um, the way that our thoughts, our consciousness, um, affects our body affects the environment around us. It feels like that's something that you really like tapped into as well. You really explored that as well. 
Oh, big time. I have, I have this saying, uh, external, the external environment will rule the way you breathe until you rule the way you breathe. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So how do people connect with you ways to plug in to what you, what you're doing? Uh, you can find me on Instagram as the black airbender on YouTube, Devon, the black airbender and on uh, Facebook, Devon, the black airbender. <laughs> Sweet. And uh, yeah, we'll put a link up for people to, to connect with you. Really appreciate, appreciate you doing this, Devon. I'm going to give a shout out to, to Ron in uh, Pennsylvania who, who uh, oh, yes, Ron. made the connection for, between you and me. Thank you, Ron. Yeah. Powerful synchronization that you were, you know, yeah, no such thing as coincidences, right? Nothing, man, because I, I saw you at that. Basically, he, he told me about you and I'm like, I think I saw him last night. You know, cause he said, cause he sent me your IG, you know, and I'm like, I think I saw that guy last night. So then I messaged you and you're like, yeah, that was me. You know? And I'm like, okay, well that's one synchronicity, right? That's one sign right there. And then tuning into your work and just feeling so much resonance, what you're sharing. And then, yeah, this, this ayahuasca thing, um, mm. synchronicities. just keep following it. We had a really great time. I'm back in, I'm based in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. Oh, North Carolina. Oh, you're not too far. Okay. Yeah. But we had a really great time in, uh, surprisingly great time in, in South. One reason is because it's just so much more open and free there compared to the rest of the country. Yeah. Right? So, um, but yeah, looking forward to spending more time down there and look forward to connecting more with you and sharing more with you and appreciate you being here. Likewise, brother.